Hello, my little demon friends. It's Halloween week, and I'm feeling the chill in the air, seeing the decorations in the streets, and hearing the cries of disenfranchised voters. We are coming to you this very special week with two celebrations, four days till Halloween and seven days till Election Day. Which day is scarier? Well, I guess we'll find out. For now, we'll satisfy your cravings for terror with two spectacular stories for you on this episode of Listen With The Lights Off, a radio horror show. Our deluge of delightful dismay and discomfort is brought to you by So Say We All and La Jolla Playhouse. I'm your host, Jennifer D. Corley. Our first story today was written by Kate Cole and is delivered to your salivating ears by Savannah Padilla, Sam DeSalvo, Rihanna Basor, Dallas McLaughlin, Victor Morris, and Diane Yvette. It's called Dollhouse and was first published in our horror anthology, Black Candies, Gross and Unlikable. Let's peek into the lives of two sisters who've shared a womb, but not much else. I saw them in her bedroom, limbs and body parts shaking in different directions, his indistinguishable from hers. Sounds of moisture and skin smacking up against each other. I only looked for a second and then kept walking, closing the door behind me as I shut myself up in my own room. I couldn't understand what I had just seen. Sarah had been bragging to me about her new boyfriend for weeks, but I never believed a word she said. Maybe because a little drool fell from the corner of her mouth as she spoke excitedly, or maybe because she couldn't look at me without her eyes wandering in different directions. Maybe it was terrible of me to think this way. Maybe I was an awful person for not believing someone could find my sister attractive but I had always assumed she was going to live her life alone. I decided I should tell our parents about what was going on. I had seen Sarah doing something dirty in her bed with a boy. They should know. After doing it, and feeling satisfied with their horrified reactions, I spent the night out with my own boyfriend. As I sat on top of his lap in the front seat of his car, rough hands grasping at my breasts, his wet mouth on my neck, I started to feel sick. I opened the door and vomited all over the pavement. As I wiped my chin, I looked down to see his hands still holding my hips. He had a glimmer in his eye and... A smile on his face. Instead of wailing like an infant and throwing temper tantrums as I had expected, Sarah barely reacted when our parents intervened. In fact, she ignored anything they had to say on the subject. She pretended like nothing had ever happened between her and the boy. And so I forgot about it. Until one day after school had let out, and I had gone to meet my sister out front as I usually did to drive us home, there she sat, cross-legged on the sidewalk, crying big fat tears that spilled upon her chubby cheeks. I looked at her for a moment from a distance. I wondered if we at all looked alike. We shared a womb for nine months, had been born minutes apart, and yet, we were nothing alike. People always say that we have the same smile, but I know they're just being nice. (laughs) 
I knelt down in front of her on one knee. What's wrong? She was inconsolable. I thought about calling our mother. Sometimes Sarah would listen to her voice on the phone and it would make her feel better. I didn't know what else would work. If I tried to pull her arm or do anything to make her move, she would definitely begin to scream. I didn't want that. There were still people around. But as soon as I pulled out the cell phone, Sarah saw me dialing and stopped crying at once. I smiled at her. Do you want to tell me what's wrong? She shook her head no. Mindlessly, I had sex outside in the grass that night with my boyfriend. My knees stained green. I climbed into the car when it was over and kissed him on the cheek as he buckled his seatbelt to drive me home. After he dropped me off, I watched his car disappear into the dark before going inside. I couldn't sleep. Dreams kept fading in and out. Dreams about Sarah. Dreams about what I had seen in her bedroom that day weeks before. Who was it that had been on top of my sister, touching her and making her feel things? Did he love her? I tossed and turned until a light touch on my shoulder woke me. I jerked my head to the right eye level to where Sarah's hand was resting. She was standing before me, looking at me, but she wasn't awake. She wasn't wearing any clothes, and she had what looked like bile on her chin. My eyes still bleary from sleep, the image of her body came into focus, and I put my hand to my mouth to cover the scream creeping out of me. She was very disproportionate, lumpy all over awkward. I used to know how my sister looked. I knew every inch of her, but as I looked at her in the dark, I began to see the unfamiliar marks that covered her legs, her stomach, her breasts. I jumped out of bed and took her by the arm. Carefully, I walked her back to her room and covered her with a blanket. I wiped her face, brushed her hair, as she fell back to sleep. I had no doubts that the mysterious boy had caused those marks. With his nails, with his teeth, with something else maybe. But when? Sarah was never to be left unsupervised. I lay in bed until morning time with my eyes wide open. As I sat in biology class the next morning, just starting to feel a little more at ease, a little more forgetful of the previous night's events, someone knocked on the door and informed the teacher that I was needed in the nurse's office. Sarah had been her normal, bubbly self at breakfast and had talked to me about childish things on the drive to school. What could be wrong? I quietly gathered my things, all eyes on me, and slipped out the door. (laughs) Down the hall from the nurse's office, I heard a mixture of confused noises. My sister's outrageous laughter bellowing out of her like it was coming from deep inside her belly and various shouts coming from both men and women. Sarah was on the floor laughing hysterically, so much so that tears trickled out of her eyes. The nurse was crouched down beside her with a tissue and only then did I see that Sarah was bleeding from the nose. I rushed over to her. What's happened? She's had an outburst. She was out of control. We had to pull her out of class. Sarah continued to laugh, but I noticed that her fists were clenched, knuckles white. (laughs) 
She was sent home that day. My mother had to pick her up from school. We were told that Sarah had lashed out at the teacher completely out of the blue. When he tried to calm her, she tried to hit him, but wound up hurting herself. The sound of her laughter that morning rang through my head. It was as if none of us were in on her joke. I crept into Sarah's room that night before bed. Where did you get those marks on your skin? Did it have anything to do with what happened at school? She ignored my questions. Do you want to play dolls? When I pressed her, she became upset, and I feared that she would throw another tantrum. I gave up, decided to leave her alone, and was about to leave the room when she stopped me. I have a boyfriend just like you. She sat on her bed and looked up at me through the bangs that covered her large forehead, her eyes glaring and wild. I know you've told me. Do you want to tell me who? She resumed playing with her dolls and said nothing. Don't you want to tell your sister about your boyfriend? Sarah stared at her dolls and said to me in her girlish but gummy voice, You know who? I certainly didn't. I had no idea. You know who? You know who? Sarah's sing-song voice filled the room. (laughs) Stop it, Sarah. You know who? You know who? Stop it! Stop it! You know who? You know who, you know who, you know who. But she wouldn't. Her (laughs) eyes began spinning in opposite directions as she looked to the ceiling and laughed. (laughs) I recoiled toward the door, crawling into my own skin. Soon my parents had come to the door and I was yelling, I don't know what she's talking about. Please make her stop. I fled the room and locked myself in the bathroom, Sarah still bellowing with laughter. Alice, will you come out, please? My knees curled up into my chest. I sat on the floor with my back to the tub. I had become fixated on a shard of glass that was sitting on the floor behind the toilet. When I finally came out, both my parents followed me into my bedroom. We need to talk with you about Sarah. They asked me questions. They wanted answers. I'm telling you, I don't know what she's talking about. You're responsible for her after school, so you should know who she's been with. Now tell us the truth. I swear, I know nothing. They were silent for a few moments. They looked at each other. Sarah said, What? Have you been hurting yourself? What? Lift up your shirt. What? No! Do you want your father to leave the room? I will if you want. What are you talking about? No! My head was spinning. They stared at me. My mother had tears in her eyes. Why would Sarah say something like that? I became furious. I got up and ran into Sarah's room, prepared to expose the hideous marks I had seen on her skin, and set my parents straight. Sarah wasn't in her bedroom. I found her in the bathroom where I had been just minutes before. She had found the shard of glass, knew it was there all along. She held it in her hand, turning it over and over like a stone. I wanted to scream for my parents to come quick, but words couldn't escape my mouth. She was standing looking in the mirror. She saw my reflection and looked at it, smiling. You know who, you know who, 
You know who. You know who. As the Irving Berlin lyric goes, Lord help the mister who comes between me and my sister, and Lord help the sister who comes between me and my man. Fun, sweet, morbid fact about Irving Berlin, even though he was Jewish, he observed every Christmas at the graveside of his son, who died at three weeks old on Christmas Day in 1928. That's why I always tell my women friends, don't get attached to anything until it's old enough to date. That was Dollhouse by Kate Cole. Now we're going to dive into the deep end of terror with a story from Black Candy's The 80s, written by Dave Moss and performed by Monique Gaffney and Thomas Morrison. Put on your tanks, because you might end up gasping for air. <laughs> This is The Swimming Lesson by Dave Moss. July 17, 1986. On the day after the Tri-City Community Center pool incident, almost all of the children who were in the water were too traumatized to be interviewed. But there was one eight-year-old boy who never stopped talking. An elementary school four blocks from the boy's house in Mesa, Arizona, let us use one of its portable classrooms for the interview. It was a box on metal stilts. Like the temporary offices where construction site foremen process time cards, except twice as wide. Climbing the stairs sent shutters through the whole structure. Inside, desks and chairs had been stacked along walls creating a timpani-like effect with each footstep on the thinly carpeted floor. At least there's a swamp cooler. A few minutes later, the room reverberated as the boy climbed the stairs. Then the building went silent as he paused at the door. It watched the door handle twist, then stop. A moment passed, then a light knock. I opened the door. Hello there. I didn't know whether to knock or just come in, because when it's school, you just come in, but you're not a teach, and I didn't want to scare you. It's okay. My name is Tabitha. But you can call me just Tab, like the soda pop. You must be J.M. In truth, I called him by his first name, but in my head he will always be J.M. I always remember my minor interviewees by their initials, because that's how it will look in affidavits and depositions. Like most kids in the Phoenix suburbs, J.M. was tan as peanut butter, his hair sun-bleached and overdue for a cut, he wore a striped alligator shirt with a collar that seemed to bother his neck. If the interview had gone a second day, I would have asked his mother to dress him in a T-shirt. I nodded to her at the bottom of the stairs as I closed the door. Where would you like to sit? Your choice. Mm, here. No, over there. He passed over the one-piece desk chairs snubbed the plastic arts and crafts table, and instead chose a pair of folding chairs and a card table he spotted folded in the corner. I would later conclude that J.M. was no less severely damaged as the other youth. The grief just had a hard time competing with the boy's natural chattiness. No matter how dark the memory... The very act of searching his memories and choosing the words to explain his world caused his eyes to glimmer. He liked questions, if only because he loved exploring his own stream of consciousness to find the answer. And like many kids of this generation, 
His language was infected by the commercials they ran between cartoons. He could hardly speak without mentioning a product or brand. I began the interview as I usually do. I'm going to ask you some questions today, and some of them will be very difficult to answer. But let's start off with an easy one. What did you have for breakfast this morning? Two waffles. One I put boysenberry syrup on, and one I put regular syrup on. And I drank this much orange juice and this much chocolate milk. And watermelon. That sounds yummy. No, wait. I only had one waffle, one half. And I think I put the regular syrup on the waffle half. Did I? I think so. The waffles were square waffles, not the circle ones. Because Mom says the circle ones are expensive and have less waffle to the waffle. <laughs> That's really interesting. Thank you. Now we're going to talk about something a little more difficult. I explained trauma so he would know what the word meant. I asked him to repeat back what he understood. It's when something bad happens to you and you might not know you're hurt because you're hurt inside and there's no blood. And you might be so hurt that your hurting part is broken and you don't know you're hurt. His paraphrasing wasn't bad. I told him that from time to time throughout the interview, I would be asking if he was feeling trauma. If it hurts, but you think you can push past it, you should say, small. And if it hurts so much that you want to take a break, you should say, large. Does that make sense? What if it hurts medium size? If it hurts medium size, then you should pay close attention to your feelings and let me know if it gets bigger. What if it hurts super big gulp size? I don't ever want you to hurt that much. If it's large, I want you to tell me and we'll stop so it doesn't get to be super big gulp. J.M. understood, and we began talking about the events of the day before. I asked him what he had had for breakfast yesterday morning before the swimming class. He'd had only an orange slice and a slice of raisin bread. The kind with frosting, but only a little, because my mom said I would get cramps if I go swimming with too much food in my stomach. Do you know what cramps are? No, but I think it's when your body freezes up and then you drown. J.M. paused. I wondered if the image of paralysis in the pool may have dislodged a traumatic memory. How do you feel now? Small. I think that maybe I can invent a way where you'd get cramps, but not drown. And how's that? I'd eat a big breakfast, maybe three waffles and watermelon and scrambled eggs. Then I'd put a tetherball pole next to the pool. I'd hang on to the tether ball, and I'd lower myself in, and the tether ball would float, and that's why I wouldn't drown. I could tell he was proud of this solution, but I had to blink hard to shake the mental image of a little boy on a fishing line. I gently moved him along in the day. His mom drove to the Tri-City Community Center, or the TCCC, as he called it. His favorite song came on while they were in the car. Musical memories proved especially triggering for J.M., Although his recollection of the lyrics were spotty, he recalled melodies several times throughout the interview. Small. Thank you for telling me. Then he continued on without missing another beat. J.M. explained his parents wanted to move from Mesa to Chandler so they could have a house with a backyard pool, but first he had to learn how to swim. He was proud that he could dog paddle, but his parents wanted him to learn to freestyle, backstroke, and butterfly. He looked not quite sad, but wistful. It was a strange look for such a young face. Are you still okay? Kid size. What's kid size? Smaller than small. That's good.
Dozens of kids were at the pool for swim class, but J.M. fell in with three boys he knew from the other summer classes at TCCC. J.M. fixated on the fashion labels on the boys' swimsuits. The first boy wore Hawaiian pattern bugle boy trunks. The second boy wore Jimmy Z brand shorts with a station wagon print. The third boy was a little smaller and was born in Switzerland, and he was wearing a white and blue Speedo. I'd seen family photos gathered from the parents. All the kids were slender and tan with sun-bleached hair and smiles full of missing and mismatched teeth. They would be indistinguishable, except for those swimsuits. I drew a thick square around the swimsuit brands, and for the rest of the interview, I mentally recorded the boys as Bugle Boy, Jimmy Z, and Speedo. J.M. didn't want to talk about his own swim trunks because they were generic from Mervyn's. J.M. joined the other boys in the men's shower room to rinse off before going to the swim lesson. Bugle Boy and Jimmy Z seemed to be a rowdy double act. J.M. was eager to be associated with the two goofuses, but not so much Speedo. J.M. recalled that the boys got into an argument about a song that came over the PA. Oh, here she comes. She's a man-eater. A spike of ice shot through my diaphragm. Watch out, boy, she'll chew you up. As he sang, I could see internal confusion in his eyes as he was torn between his enjoyment of singing and the underlying horror of the words. He scratched at his neck beneath the collar. I asked him again about the pain, but he didn't answer. Instead, he began recounting each of the boys' positions on the song like a stenographer reading back a transcript in court. Apparently, Maneater had been a great subject of debate playing out in summer schools around the country. Bugle Boy thought she was a vampire, while Jimmy Z thought she was a werewolf. J.M. reasoned that a Maneater was actually a specific kind of monster called a Maneater, because if she were a vampire or a werewolf, the song would have just said she was a vampire or a werewolf. Speedo said he didn't think it was a real Maneater. Just a lady who eats boys' feelings. Your nose is running. Here's a tissue. Thank you. Are you feeling pain? Large. Okay. Let's... No, it was large for like five, no, like seven seconds, but now it's medium. Medium small. I decided it was time for a break anyway. He pulled out a sheet of fruit leather from his pocket. He peeled away the perforated cartoon shapes and ate them one by one, leaving only the silhouettes, like chalk lines at a crime scene. I blinked that mental image away as he crumpled it up and popped it into his mouth. He swallowed, and we began again. The boys left the shower room and returned to their mothers to get lathered with sunscreen and to pick up their towels. J.M. wanted me to know that his beach towel featured the California raisins. He was envious of Jimmy Z's Thundercats towel, but glad he didn't have Speedo's plain sailboat towel. Bugle Boy had a Disneyland towel, which was only cool because he was the only kid J.M. knew who had been to Disneyland. J.M. abruptly stood up. Mom and Dad say I have to be this tall before they will take me. I steered him back on topic. I asked about Coach Beth. J.M. remembered flip-flops and a maroon one-piece bathing suit under a sleeveless TCCC shirt. J.M. noted dutifully the whistle on a neon pink shoelace hung around her neck and the ponytail that fed through the back of a Sun Devil's baseball cap. While the mothers decamped to the air-conditioned main building, Coach Beth had the children line up, lie belly down on their towels on the ground, and practice various strokes. She handed out neon green foam boards to each of the kids. One child was refusing to go in the pool without his inflatable water wings, stomping his feet and crying as Coach Beth took him aside. Not quite out of earshot, the boys began to tease him and call him a baby. Even Speedo seized the opportunity to insert someone else into a punchline. Speedo said the boy probably pees in the pool, but then Jimmy Z said... If you pee in the pool, the water turns red. 
The gruesome irony plunged into the pit of my stomach again. But he seemed not to have noticed his own foreshadowing. Or maybe he had. And I just couldn't tell. It was worth asking. How are you feeling right now? Small. Again, J.M. laid out everyone's positions about whether the pool changed color if you peed. Bugle Boy and Jimmy Z seemed to promote the idea, if only because of the mischief the rumor would cause. J.M. knew that there was a trap in the question, and so remained agnostic. Speedo fell right into it, declaring that it might be true at other pools, but not this one. Bugle Boy and Jimmy Z said that he could only know if he had peed in the pool before. Everyone but Speedo erupted in laughter. Coach Beth broke off from the kid with water wings to scold the boys for making so much noise. Speedo asked point blank whether the red water pee rumor was real, and she sent them to talk to the pool maintenance man, Mr. Lucas, who would dispel any urban legend by demonstrating how the chemical and filtration systems worked. James' posture stiffened as he described the suspect in custody. Lucas Carcarinus, a.k.a. Lucas Zambi, a.k.a. Lucas Van Royen. But the boy only knew him as Mr. Lucas. Saying the name, the boy's head sunk between his shoulders and he pulled his knees together. Can you describe what Mr. Lucas looked like? I don't... Let's try closing your eyes and starting with his feet. Okay. J.M.'s description matched what was logged on the suspect's booking sheet. Steel-toed boots, denim overalls, a utility belt with a banana bunch of keys on a retractable cord. He wore a tank top, and his shoulders were bare, soot-colored, and shiny. He looked kind of like Destro. Who's Destro? He's a bad guy on G.I. Joe, but not as bad as Cobra Commander. Because sometimes he fights Cobra Commander and helps the G.I. Joes, but he wears a metal mask. And Eventually, he explained Destro was a villain, a with a shiny gray face and bald head. That checked out with the black and white mugshot I'd seen. Earlier in the interview, J.M. would look me in the eyes or he would turn his eyes toward the carpeted roof of the portable classroom while he sorted out his memories. Now his eyes were fixed on his hands, tight in his lap. How does it feel talking about this? His lips moved, but he didn't say anything. Do you want to stop? No. Let's take a deep breath in. Okay, now let it out. Before he depleted his exhale, he began again, this time speaking rapidly. The suspect had the four boys gather around a heavy metal lid on the ground. He had a tool, and it was like a T. It was like a T-shape, made out of metal. I had seen this object earlier in the evidence box. A solid steel cylinder, the thickness and length of a roll of dimes, with a thin rod jutting out the middle. At the tip of the rod was a small rectangle. No one knew what it was for. He had it in his hand like this. Like it was his middle finger. Like he was flipping the bird, but pointed down. He stuck that pointy part in a hole, in the lid, and he twisted, and then he pulled the lid off. Mystery solved. The lid revealed a narrow, deep hole about eight inches across by J.M.'s hand illustration. He told me he could hear the faint sloshing of water. Mr. Lucas said there was a shark down there. He said that sharks aren't good mommies, and they would eat their babies if they didn't have a special liquid that made them not hungry. He said he puts the liquid in the water every day to keep the kids safe. But because we were horsing around, he wasn't going to put it in the water. So he had to be extra good not to make the shark angry by being bad. My breath stopped. 
Each boy peered into the hole, not even wide enough to drop one of those miniature basketballs. J.M. could see a shimmer in the darkness. His reflected silhouette distorting with the water's movement. Then Mr. Lucas sang a song. Do you remember how the song went? I don't know. It didn't have words. I recognized the song. I'd seen the preview before another film. Had you heard that song before? No. Large? Yeah. It was as good a time as any for a lunch break. <laughs> On the drive, J.M. twisted the FM knob looking for songs and advertising jingles he knew. Each song seemed to put the interview further behind him and propel him closer to whatever plane of joy usually keeps eight-year-old boys afloat. Su-su-studio. Whoa. Su-su-studio. Whoa. Su-studio seemed to be playing on every station, and even when I turned the engine off, he kept singing it. Okay. Let's race for it. We ran from the car, through the scorching midday sun, to the cool McDonald's air conditioning. What would you like? McNuggets Happy Meal with an orange drink. One four-piece chicken McNuggets Happy Meal with an orange drink, and I'll have... Uh, what does your mom order? A McDLT! One of whatever a McDLT is, please. And a Diet Coke. My burger came in a double-wide styrofoam box, splayed like an open book. Tomato, lettuce, and cheese on one side, patty on the other, and I had to combine them together. J.M.'s lunch came with a plastic toy truck described as kid-powered. The Happy Meal box was designed to be reassembled into a ramp. We built it together and then took turns jumping the car. The more genuine his laughs were, the more conscious I became that my smile was a forced grimace. I knew we'd be back in that room in half an hour while past and future had no grip on J.M. I asked J.M. if he wanted dessert, and he argued with himself for a solid minute about whether he wanted a chocolate or strawberry milkshake this time. How about a swirl of both? I don't know. I don't think they do that at this one. One second. He was right, or so the board cashier told me. So I flashed her manager my badge and then gestured with my eyes at J.M. back in the booth, launching his kid-powered truck into the air. It took the manager a moment to make the connection, but then I could see his face turn ashen when he came to the realization. Any cop interviewing a kid today must be connected to the TCCC disaster that dominated the news last night. Um, here you go. Chocolate and strawberry swirl. I poured it myself. That is nice of you. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have something else for the boy. Here's this month's collector's drinking glass. You, you, you see it's election themed with a, a little hamburger president. <laughs> it says McVote 86. I had to explain McVote 86 to J.M., 
and ended up talking about how Senator Barry Goldwater was retiring and Navy hero John McCain was certain to succeed him. We turned the burger politician with his sesame seed grin on its side and took turns jumping the truck into the glass. On the ride back, J.M. slid the straw up and down in the cup like a cellist bow, gleefully adding his own accompaniment to, once again, Susudio. Susudio. Whoa. Susudio. Whoa. I felt sick to my stomach. If you're done with your orange drink, could you please put it in the trash? Okay. And let's just put all this stuff on the table and set it aside. The truck and that McVote glass. Tab, my mom says if I talk to you, you can make sure that Mr. Lucas never hurts anyone again. Is that true? That's what I want to do, and you can help. I think I can. I can do large. That's very brave. But can we stop if I say super big gulp? Of course. I began to worry that I would break before J.M. did if I didn't keep taps on my rising anxiety. I trained my eyes on that McVote 86 glass sitting on the table. I visualized a ring of water inside the glass, at the base just touching the soles of the hamburger politician sneakers at the bottom of the jet ramp. Two... Sips of liquid dread. Now that he was recharged on fried calories and sugar, the story poured out of J.M. like a lawn sprinkler. Half anecdotes, disjointed details, tangents to tangents and many self-corrections. He would digress on every sensory input, every color and texture and smell. Yet the longer he spoke the crisper the picture in my imagination became. He and I put it together. Together. After the boys left the maintenance shed, they argued about what story they would tell the other kids about what they saw in Mr. Lucas's pool hole. Bugle Boy wanted to say he saw a huge fin... Jimmy Z thought it would be scarier to say it was a lot of smaller fins. Speedo said it wasn't right to lie to the other kids because nothing was down there. I stayed quiet because I didn't want to say... I was scared to say... That I that saw, I saw something, something down, down there. there. I mentally moved the water line in the McDonald's glass up to the hamburger politician's shins. The boys rejoined the other kids by the edge of the pool... That one boy was still wearing water wings. Tantrums sometimes work. Coach Beth ordered everyone to get in the water and line up along a metal safety bar, lining the inner lip of the pool. We held onto the bar and then we kicked our legs to make splashes. The water looked like light green-blue, like lime jello. Bugle Boy and Jimmy Z competed for the biggest splash. Speedo struggled to keep above water. I really tried to get it right because my mom was going to be checking in with Coach Beth and... He really wanted to move to a house house with a a pool. pool. He really wanted a house with a pool. Then Coach Beth told us to practice breathing by putting our faces in the water and blowing bubbles. That's when we saw the glass thing. The glass dome. A couple feet beneath the water line on the pool wall. J.M. pointed out the dome to the others. Speedo said it was just a pool light. Bugle Boy and Jimmy Z immediately started to knock on it. But you can't punch hard in water, so they started kicking it. I thought about my heartbeat. 
Then I looked back to the McDonald's glass and visualized the ribbon of chlorine blue water lifting to the hamburger politician's waist. His hands in the air, once waving to his supporters, were now reaching out for a lifeguard. Walking along the edge of the pool, Coach Beth handed out small kickboards to each of the children, then jumped in herself. The water came up to her armpits. She showed the kids how to use the kicks they just learned to propel themselves on the boards. J.M. motored from one end of the pool to the other. Like I was body surfing in my own backyard pool. Meanwhile, Speedo struggled to keep a grip on the slippery board. With each return lap, Bugle Boy and Jimmy Z dared each other to kick harder and harder at the glass dome. On the fifth lap, Bugle Boy and Jimmy Z arrived at the dome at the same time. They each landed with both feet on the dome. And then, and they, then they kicked, kicked off. off. The glass cracked and the lid sunk to the bottom, and then you could see that black hole. The water level rose above the burger politician's eyeglasses. I should have stopped the interview. Instead, I took a gulp of air and held my breath. Something huge and gray shot through the water. It moved in slow motion. It was still so much faster than I could paddle. Something rough, like old sandpaper, brushed up against my knee. I heard a kid call out, Look, that kid's peeing in the pool! The kid was pointing at Speedo, wide-eyed, engulfed by a red cloud. The gray shape looped around the far end of the pool, dragging Speedo. Then a second and a third and a fourth shape cut through the water. Bugle Boy and Jimmy Z became a tangle of flailing limbs and choking screams as they tried to climb on top of each other. I pointed my kickboard at the shallow end and just started going. A song I like played on the pool sound system. After the boys of summer are gone. The water breached the lip of the McDonald's glass. Rivulets cascaded down onto the table. Mr. McVoat flailed in the water. As the underwater shapes attacked, the pool became a minefield of thrashing children and blood and bowels. Coach Beth wrestled one of the things in a bear hug. She lost her balance, bashed her ASU cap against a handrail, and sank to the bottom. The daylight was blinding. J.M.'s eyes... My eyes burned and pressure compounded behind his nose as he kickboarded for his life. At the edge of the water, he could see the silhouette of an adult who looked like he was about to help the boy with water wings out of the pool. But then, the man's head eclipsed the sun. It was Mr. Lucas. He reached out with that T-shaped tool. He held it in his hand. Like a metal middle finger. He hooked the kid's water wing, swung the boy into the air, and lobbed him back into the pool. Then Mr. Lucas turned in J.M.'s direction. I held my kickboard out like this, like a shield. And then I closed my eyes, and I put my face in the water, and I blew bubbles. Water bubbled volcanically from the top of the glass. A waterfall washing over the drowning hamburger politician. Please, kid, just say super big gulp. It can stop. And it did. The mothers rushed Mr. Lucas, pinning him to the deck, knocking the T-shaped tool from his hand. <laughs> Someone pulled J.M. from the water. The final thing he remembered was being bundled in his California raisins towel. When the first responders arrived, they found dozens of neon green foam boards floating on calm red water like an upturned field of tombstones after a tornado. Tab, I need a pee. Of course. Of course. The portable wasn't fitted with plumbing, so J.M. had to visit the brick-and-mortar building next door. His footsteps down the stairs shook the room. A moment later, heavier footsteps stomped up the same stairs. A forensic tech delivered a red biohazard bag 
they drained the pool. When J.M. returned, for the first time since we met, he felt completely silent. It was like his reserve silo of words had run down to its dregs. He seemed almost embarrassed by the story he told. I showed him the biohazard bag and explained what had to happen next. I told him not to think about his friends, just to focus on the objects. Do you understand? Yes, Tab. The first plastic-sealed piece of evidence was a torn scrap of fabric about the size of his palm, the petals of a tropical flower still discernible. I laid it on the table. Remember, focus on the object. Don't think about anything else. Do you recognize it? It's Bugle Boy. I removed the second baggie. It contained a tubular leg of fabric, a singular swimming trunk with a station wagon print. And this one? That's Jimmy Z. The final bag contained a full pair of thin swim briefs, soggy and heavy with half-congealed blood. I choked back revulsion. Speedo. Positive identification. It was like he'd knocked over the McDonald's glass, the water had poured out, and Mr. McVoat could breathe sweet air again. Tab? Yes? I don't think Mom and Dad are going to get us a house with a pool anymore. Super big gulp. I ended the session and sent the boy with his happy mailbox home with his mother. The forensic tech entered the portable classroom. I handed him back the biohazard bag. Did you get what you need, Tab? Nobody needed any of this. Let's just get this in front of a judge. I looked back at the table. J.M. had left the souvenir drinking glass behind. Mr. McVote was bone dry, back to waving at his fans. I don't suppose you collect McDonald's glasses. That's one way to control population. Where's Mr. Lucas when the neighborhood kids won't stop playing outside my house during my bourbon hour? Ugh. Anyway, that is all we have time for today, my dears. Please meet up with us again in the future for more exploration of dark emotions, confrontation of terrors, and dealing with the surreality of this thing that is life. Don't do it by looking at Instagram. Do it by joining us for more literary horror on Listen With The Lights Off. This episode of Listen With The Lights Off, a radio horror show, is created by So Say We All in partnership with La Jolla Playhouse as part of their 2020 Digital Without Walls series. All the stories on this show come from So Say We All Press's horror anthologies, Black Candies, created by the horrifically talented Ryan Bradford. Please do buy the books, available through our website, so say we all online.com. Listen with the Lights Off is produced by myself, Jennifer D. Corley. Editing is myself and Justin Hudnell, So Say We All's executive director. Dollhouse was directed by Yolanda Franklin, and The Swimming Lesson was directed by Melissa Coleman-Reed. At La Jolla Playhouse, Chicole Kitchen is artistic programs manager and local casting director. Mary Cook is communications director. Amy Ashton is producing associate. Becky Beagleson is director of public relations. Mia Fiorella is director of sales and marketing. 
and Nancy Showers is Senior Multimedia Director. Our intro theme is by Kurt Conan from AMFM Music. Our outro theme is by Daniel Schreyer. And all of the scoring and sound effects you hear during the stories performed come from our Foley artist wizard, Scott Paulson. If you'd like to learn more about La Jolla Playhouse, visit lahoyaplayhouse.org. And to keep in the loop with So Say We All, read more about the artists who made this project possible and become involved as one of our future storytellers, visit sosayweallonline.com or just find us on social media. Until next time, I'm Jennifer D. Corley. And remember, if you find yourself feeling terrified and alone, there's probably good reason. Now, more than ever. Thank you.